The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Chapter Seven. Tick running and a heartbreak. The harder Tom tried to fasten his mind on his book, the more his ideas wandered. So at last, with a sigh and a yawn, he gave it up. It seemed to him that the noon recess would never come. The air was utterly dead. There was not a breath stirring. It was the sleepiest of sleepy days. The drowsing murmur of the five and twenty studying scholars soothed the soul like the spell that is in the murmur of bees. Away off in the flaming sunshine, Cardiff Hill lifted its soft green sides through a shimmering veil of heat tinted with the purple of distance. A few birds floated on lazy wing high in the air. No other living thing was visible but some cows, and they were asleep. Tom's heart ached to be free, or else to have something of interest to do to pass the dreary time. His hand wandered into his pocket, and his face lit up with a glow of gratitude that was prayer, though he did not know it. Then, furtively, the percussion cap box came out. He released the tick and put him on the long, flat desk. The creature probably glowed with a gratitude that amounted to prayer, too, at this moment, but it was premature, for when he started thankfully to travel off, Tom turned him aside with a pin and made him take a new direction. Tom's bosom friend sat next him, suffering just as Tom had been, and now he was deeply and gratefully interested in this entertainment in an instant. This bosom friend was Joe Harper. The two boys were sworn friends all the week and embattled enemies on Saturdays. Joe took a pin out of his lapel and began to assist in exercising the prisoner. The sport grew in interest momently. Soon Tom said that they were interfering with each other, and neither getting the fullest benefit of the tick. So he put Joe's slate on the desk and drew a line down the middle of it from top to bottom. Now, said he, as long as he is on your side, you can stir him up, and I'll let him alone. But if you let him get away and get on my side, you're to leave him alone as long as I can keep him from crossing over. All right, go ahead. Start him up. The tick escaped from Tom presently and crossed the equator. Joe harassed him a while, and then he got away and crossed back again. This change of base occurred often. While one boy was worrying the tick with absorbing interest, the other would look on with interest as strong. The two heads bowed together over the slate, and the two souls dead to all things else. At last luck seemed to settle and abide with Joe. The tick tried this, that, and the other course, and got as excited and as anxious as the boys themselves, but time and again, just as he would have victory in his very grasp, so to speak, and Tom's fingers would be twitching to begin, Joe's pin would deftly head him off and keep possession. At last Tom could stand it no longer. The temptation was too strong, so he reached out and lent a hand with his pin. Joe was angry in a moment. Said he, "'Tom, you let him alone. I only just want to stir him up a little, Joe. No, sir, it ain't fair. You just let him alone. Blame it, I ain't going to stir him much. Let him alone, I tell you. Well, I won't. You shall. He's on my side of the line. Look here, Joe Harper, whose is that tick? I don't care whose tick he is. He's on my side of the line, and you shan't touch him. Well, I'll just bet I will, though. He's my tick, and I'll do what I blame please with him, or die. A tremendous whack came down on Tom's shoulders, and its duplicate on Joe's and for the space of two minutes the dust continued to fly from the two jackets and the whole school to enjoy it. The boys had been too absorbed to notice the hush that had stolen upon the school a while before, when the master came tiptoeing down the room and stood over them. He had contemplated a good part of the performance before he contributed his bit of variety to it. When school broke up at noon, Tom flew to Becky Thatcher and whispered in her ear, "'Put on your bonnet and let on you're going home, and when you get to the corner, Give the rest of them the slip, and turn down through the lane and come back. I'll go the other way, and come it over them the same way." So the one went off with one group of scholars, and the other with another. In a little while the two met at the bottom of the lane, and when they reached the school they had it all to themselves. Then they sat together with a slate before them, and Tom gave Becky the pencil and held her hand in his, guiding it, and so created another surprising house. When the interest in art began to wane, the two fell to talking. Tom was swimming in bliss. He said, "'Do you love rats?' "'No, I hate them.' "'Well, I do, too. Live ones. But I mean dead ones, to swing round your head with a string. 
"'No, I, I don't care for rats much, anyway. What I like is chewing gum.' "'Oh, I should say so. I wish I had some now.' "'Do you? I've got some. I'll let you chew it a while, but you must give it back to me.' That was agreeable, so they chewed it turn about, and dangled their legs against the bench in excess of contentment. "'Was you ever at a circus?' said Tom. "'Yes, and my pa's going to take me again some time, if I'm good. I've been to the circus three or four times, lots of times. Church ain't shucks to a circus. There's things going on at a circus all the time. I'm going to be a clown in a circus when I grow up.' "'Oh, are you? That will be nice. They're so lovely, all spotted up. Yes, that's so. And they get slathers of money, most a dollar a day, Ben Rogers says. Say, Becky, was you ever engaged? What's that? Why, engaged to be married. No. Would you like to? I reckon so. I don't know. What is it like? Like? Why, it ain't like anything. You only just tell a boy you won't ever have anybody but him, ever, 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 and then you kiss, and that's all. Any, anybody can do it. Kiss? What do you kiss for? Why, that, you know, is to... Well, they always do that. Everybody? Why, yes, everybody that's in love with each other. Do you remember what I wrote on the slate? Y yes What was it? I shan't tell you. Shall I tell you? Y yes but some other time. No, now. No, not now. To-morrow. Oh, no, now. Please, Becky, I'll whisper it. I'll, I'll whisper it ever so easy. Becky hesitating, Tom took silence for consent, and passed his arm about her waist and whispered the tale ever so softly, with his mouth close to her ear. And then he added, Now you whisper it to me, just the same. She resisted for a while, and then said, you turn your face away so you can't see, and, and then I will. But you mustn't ever tell anybody, will you, Tom? Now you won't, will you? No, indeed, indeed I won't. Now, Becky. He turned his face away, and she bent timidly around till her breath stirred his curls and whispered, I love you. Then she sprang away and ran around and around the desks and benches, with Tom after her, and took refuge in a corner at last, with her little white apron to her face. Tom clasped her about her neck and pleaded, "'Now, Becky, it's all done, all over but the kiss. Don't you be afraid of that. It ain't anything at all. Please, Becky.' And he tugged at her apron and the hands. By and by she gave up and let her hands drop. Her face, all glowing with the struggle, came up and submitted. Tom kissed the red lips and said, "'Now it's all done, Becky. And always after this, you know, you ain't ever to love anybody but me. And you ain't ever to marry anybody but me. Never, never, and forever, will you? No, I'll never love anybody but you, Tom, and I'll never marry anybody but you. And you ain't to ever marry anybody but me, either. Certainly, of course. That, that's part of it. And always coming to school, or when we're going home, you're to walk with me, when there ain't anybody looking, and you choose me and I choose you at parties, because that's the way you do when you're engaged. It's so nice I never heard of it before. Oh, it's ever so gay. Why, me and Amy Lawrence—' The big eyes told Tom his blunder, and he stopped confused. Oh, Tom, then I ain't the first you've ever been engaged to. The child began to cry, and Tom said, Oh, don't cry, Becky. I don't care for her any more. Yes, you do, Tom. You know you do. Tom tried to put his arm about her neck, but she pushed him away and turned her face to the wall and went on crying. Tom tried again, with soothing words in his mouth, and was repulsed again. Then his pride was up, and he strode away and went outside. He stood about, restless and uneasy for a while, glancing at the door every now and then, hoping she would repent and come to find him. But she did not. Then he began to feel badly, and fear that he was in the wrong. It was a hard struggle with him to make new advances now, but he nerved himself to it and entered. She was still standing back there in the corner, sobbing, with her face to the wall. Tom's heart smote him. He went to her and stood a moment, not knowing exactly how to proceed. Then he said hesitatingly, "'Becky, I—I I don't care for anybody but you.' No reply, but sobs. "'Becky,' pleadingly, "'Becky, won't you say something?' More sobs. Tom got out his chiefest jewel, a brass knob from the top of an andiron, and passed it around her so that she could see it, and said, 
"'Please, Becky, won't you take it?' She struck it to the floor. Then Tom marched out of the house and over the hills and far away to return to school no more that day. Presently Becky began to suspect. She ran to the door. He was not in sight. She flew around to the play-yard. He was not there. Then she called, "'Tom! Come back, Tom!' She listened intently, but there was no answer. She had no companions but silence and loneliness. So she sat down to cry again and upbraid herself, and by this time the scholars began to gather again, and she had to hide her griefs and still her broken heart and take up the cross of a long, dreary, aching afternoon, with none among the strangers about her to exchange sorrows with. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 A Pirate Bold to Be Tom dodged hither and thither through lanes until he was well out of the track of returning scholars, and then fell into a moody jog. He crossed a small branch two or three times, because of a prevailing juvenile superstition that to cross water baffles pursuit. Half an hour later he was disappearing behind the Douglas mansion on the summit of Cardiff Hill, and the schoolhouse was hardly distinguishable away off in the valley behind him. He entered a dense wood, picked his pathless way to the center of it, and sat down on a mossy spot under a spreading oak. There was not even a zephyr stirring. The dead noonday heat had even stilled the songs of the birds. Nature lay in a trance that was broken by no sound but the occasional far-off hammering of a woodpecker, and this seemed to render the pervading silence and sense of loneliness the more profound. The boy's soul was steeped in melancholy. His feelings were in happy accord with his surroundings. He sat long with his elbows on his knees, and his chin in his hands, meditating. It seemed to him that life was but a trouble at best, and he more than half envied Jimmy Hodges, so lately released. It must be very peaceful, he thought, to lie and slumber and dream for ever and ever, with the wind whispering through the trees and caressing the grass and the flowers over the grave, and nothing to bother and grieve about, ever any more. If he only had a clean Sunday-school record, he could be willing to go, and be done with it all. Now, as to this girl, what had he done? Nothing. He had meant the best in the world, and been treated like a dog, like a very dog. She would be sorry some day, maybe when it was too late. Ah, if he could only die temporarily! But the elastic heart of youth cannot be compressed into one constrained shape long at any time. Tom presently began to drift insensibly back into the concerns of this life again. What if he turned his back now, and disappeared mysteriously? What if he went away, ever so far away, into unknown countries beyond the seas, and never came back any more? How would she feel then? The idea of being a clown recurred to him now, only to fill him with disgust. For frivolity and jokes and spotted tights were an offence when they intruded themselves upon a spirit that was exalted into the vague, august realm of the romantic. No, he would be a soldier, and return after long years all war-worn and illustrious. No, better still, he would join the Indians, and hunt buffaloes, and go on the warpath in the mountain ranges, and the trackless great plains of the far west, and away in the future come back a great chief, bristling with feathers, hideous with paint, and prance into Sunday school some drowsy summer morning, with a blood-curling war-whoop, and sear the eyeballs of all his companions with unappeasable envy. But, no, there was something gaudier even than this. He would be a pirate. That was it. Now his future lay plain before him, and glowing with unimaginable splendor. How his name would fill the world, and make people shudder! How gloriously he would go ploughing the dancing seas in his long, low, black-hulled racer, the spirit of the storm, with his grisly flag flying at the fore! and at the zenith of his fame how he would suddenly appear at the old village and stalk into church brown and weather-beaten in his black velvet doublet and trunks his great jack-boots his crimson sash his belt bristling with horse-pistols his crime-rusted cutlass at his side his slouch-hat with waving plumes his black flag unfurled with a skull and crossbones on it and here with swelling ecstasy the whisperings it's Tom Sawyer, the pirate, the black avenger of the Spanish main. 
Yes, it was settled. His career was determined. He would run away from home and enter upon it. He would start the very next morning. Therefore he must now begin to get ready. He would collect his resources together. He went to a rotten log near at hand and began to dig under one end of it with his barlow knife. He soon struck wood that sounded hollow. He put his hand there and uttered this incantation impressively. What hasn't come here, come. What's here, stay here. Then he scraped away the dirt and exposed a pine shingle. He took it up and disclosed a shapely little treasure house whose bottom and sides were of shingles. In it lay a marble. Tom's astonishment was boundless. He scratched his head with perplexed air and said, Well, that beats anything. Then he tossed the marble away pettishly and stood cogitating. The truth was that a superstition of his had failed here, which he and all his comrades had always looked upon as infallible. If you buried a marble with certain necessary incantations and left it alone a fortnight, and then opened the place with the incantation he had just used, you would find that all the marbles you had ever lost had gathered themselves together there, meantime, no matter how widely they had been separated. But now this thing had actually and unquestionably failed. Tom's whole structure of faith was shaken to its foundations. He had many a time heard of this thing succeeding, but never of its failing before. It did not occur to him that he had tried it several times before, himself, but could never find the hiding-places afterward. He puzzled over the matter some time, and finally decided that some witch had interfered and broken the charm. He thought he would satisfy himself on that point, so he searched around till he found a small sandy spot with a little funnel-shaped depression in it. He laid himself down and put his mouth close to this depression and called, Doodlebug, Doodlebug, tell me what I want to know. Doodlebug, Doodlebug, tell me what I want to know. The sand began to work, and presently a small black bug appeared for a second and then darted under again in a fright. He doesn't tell, so it was a witch that done it. I just knowed it. He well knew the futility of trying to contend against witches, so he gave up discouraged. But it occurred to him that he might as well have the marble he had just thrown away, and therefore he went and made a patient search for it. But he could not find it. Now he went back to his treasure house and carefully placed himself just as he had been standing when he tossed the marble away. Then he took another marble from his pocket and tossed it in the same way, saying, Brother, go find your brother. He watched where it stopped and went there and looked. But it must have fallen short or gone too far, so he tried twice more. The last repetition was successful. The two marbles lay within a foot of each other. Just here the blast of a toy tin trumpet came faintly down the green aisles of the forest. Tom flung off his jacket and trousers, turned a suspender into a belt, raked away some brush behind the rotten log, disclosing a rude bow and arrow, a lath sword, and a tin trumpet, and in a moment had seized these things and bounded away bare-legged with fluttering shirt. He presently halted under a great elm, blew an answering blast, and then began to tiptoe and look warily out, this way and that. He said cautiously to an imaginary company, "'Hold, my merry men! Keep hid till I blow!' Now appeared Joe Harper, as airily clad and elaborately armed as Tom. Tom called, "'Hold! Who comes into Sherwood Forest without my pass?' "'Guy of Giesborn wants no man's pass. Who art thou that—that—' that "'Dares to hold such language,' said Tom, prompting, for they talked by the book from memory. "'Who art thou that dares to hold such language? I, indeed, I am Robin Hood, as thy caitiff carcass soon shall know. Then art thou indeed that famous outlaw? Right gladly will I dispute with thee the passes of the merry wood. Have at thee!' They took their lath swords, dumped their other traps on the ground, and struck a fencing attitude, foot to foot, and began a grave, careful combat, two up and two down. Presently Tom said, "'Now, if you've got the hang, go it lively!' So they went it lively, panting and perspiring with the work. By and by Tom shouted, "'Fall! Fall! Why don't you fall?' "'I shan't! Why don't you fall yourself? You're getting the worst of it.' "'Why, that ain't anything. I can't fall. That ain't the way it is in the book.' The book says, then with one black-handed stroke he slew poor Guy of Giesborn. You're to turn round and let me hit you on the back. There was no getting around the authorities, so Joe turned, received the whack, and fell. Now, said Joe, getting up, you got to let me kill you. That's fair. 
"'Why, I can't do that. It ain't in the book. Well, it's blamed mean, that's all. Well, say, Joe, you can be Friar Tuck or, or Much, the miller's son, and lamb me with a quarter-staff. Or I'll be the Sheriff of Nottingham, and you be Robin Hood a little while, and kill me." This was satisfactory, and so these adventures were carried out. Then Tom became Robin Hood again, and was allowed by the treacherous nun to bleed his strength away through his neglected wound. And at last Joe, representing a whole tribe of weeping outlaws, dragged him sadly forth, gave his bow into his feeble hands, and Tom said, "'Where this arrow falls, there bury poor Robin Hood under the greenwood tree.' Then he shot the arrow and fell back, and would have died, but he lit on a nettle, and sprang up too gaily for a corpse. The boys dressed themselves, hid their accoutrements, and went off grieving that there were no outlaws any more and wondering what modern civilization could claim to have done to compensate for their loss. They said they would rather be outlaws a year in Sherwood Forest than President of the United States forever. End of chapter 8